Well, this Advent season, we have been working through the different, um, different words of, of Advent or maybe the different candles. There's lots of different ways to, to slice it, and we've, we've sliced it this way. Different guys have preached the last four weeks of, of Advent, and I'm the, the fourth. A couple weeks ago, Ryan Brown preached on the hope of Christmas, that we should have hope from Hebrews chapter 6, and we should hold fast to hope. Um, two weeks ago, Troy Bedgood. The peace of Christmas, Isaiah 53, and the, the peace that outlasts the Christmas season that we find in Jesus. Last week, Brian Mulder, the joy of Christmas, from Zephaniah chapter 3, how strife dissolves into joy in the coming of Christ. And this week, our topic here is the love of Christmas. My message this morning is entitled, Christmas Love. And to see this, we're going to really focus on one simple verse of Scripture, in fact, it could be well argued that this is the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3.16. And so before you open your Bibles there, maybe if you did, you can kind of close your Bibles. I just want us to see how many of us have memorized this verse, John 3.16. I would guess many of us will be in a little bit different version, but let's just all say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so it got muddled there, all of us in our different versions, but uh, let's all say it together in this version, the ESV. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. There we see the love of God in the gift of His Son, so that we by faith, may have eternal life. It's a gospel. That's Christmas. God giving His Son so that we can have eternal life. This is Christmas love. And this is what I mean by, by Christmas love. And, and just to clarify a little bit, this, this morning as I speak on love, I'm not going to talk about our love for Christmas. Though I think there's lots of things about Christmas to love, whether it's the, the songs or the gifts or the traditions or the family or the food. Those things are all wonderful. But I'm not talking today about our love for Christmas I'm talking about God's love towards us, shown in Christmas. Now, this is, this is where my message is a little bit different than the other three messages we heard. When, when Ryan spoke about hope, he spoke about our hope. How we can ground our hope in the character of God and in the promises of God from Hebrews 6. And we have strong hope. We should hold fast to that hope. When Troy spoke about peace, it, yes, it, it is our peace, but it is God's peace as well. It's the, the peace that God gives, the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross because our sins have been dealt with in full, and that peace just outlasts the Christmas season. It is the peace that, that we have with God. When Brian spoke about joy, he spoke about our joy, how, how coming to the Lord gives us reason, the coming of the Lord gives us reason to have joy even beyond our current circumstances. Right? And we can enjoy today because Christ came already, and yet He will come again, not yet. And so we can rejoice even though our circumstances are difficult. But my message this morning isn't talking about our hope or our peace, or our joy. My message this morning is talking about God's love for us. Really, because that's what John 3.16 is talking about. This verse says nothing about our love for God, though it is the absolute right response. Right? We love because He first loved us. He loved us, therefore we ought to, to love Him as well. But this verse tells us everything about God's love towards us in sending His Son, which is the message of Christmas I have three simple points this morning. I just want to start by, by looking at God's great love. And we see that here in John 3.16, first, first phrase, right? For God so loved the world. Those verses are meant to dazzle us with the, the love of God. His love is so great for the world that He gave His prized possession. He gave His Son. It's God's love for the world. The world's a large place. 8,000 miles in diameter. 25,000 miles in circumference. The surface area of the earth, 200 million square miles. 58 million square miles of land. The highest mountain, 29,000 feet, that's five and a half miles high. But did you know the lowest crevice of the earth reaches down seven miles deep in the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench near the Pacific Ocean near Indonesia? Seven and a half miles down. The earth's a big place, and God's love is equally big. But John 3.16 isn't talking about the, the, the physical planet. It's not talking about the physical world. It's talking about people in the world. And there's lots of people in the world. 7.7 million billion people in the world. It's a lot of people. 
In fact, if you try to count to 7.7 billion people, it takes 244 years if you say one per second. It's a long time. None of us will be able to count that high. It's a lot of people on the planet. But, but we don't measure love by breadth. We measure love by depth. And I think that's the idea what, what we see here in John 3.16. We don't, we don't buy, admire the man who loves 30 women. We admire the man who loves one woman. We admire the man who loves one woman deeply and stays loyal for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health and love and cherish till death does he part. That's how we measure love. That's the, the depth of love. Not so much the breadth of love. And that's what makes God's love so great. See, when, when Jesus died for us, we weren't so lovable. We weren't rich or attractive. We were sinful and rebellious. We were of no benefit to God. You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 of, of the people that God chose to be in His church. Not the, not the mighty and the rich, but the base and the ignoble. See, who once that He chose. But still, God, God loves us. And that very fact is a demonstration of the love of God. Is that Paul said in Romans 5 verse 8, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The very fact that we were sinners in that state when God loved us, that shows His great love. And that's the idea here, that God's great love for the world, that He, he, went, he sent His Son because they were, were sinners and in need of a Savior, and so He sent the Son into the world. Because truth be known, when, when, you, show to, when you show your love to objects, when the objects of your love are not lovable, it's when your love truly shines forth. Right, see, it's one thing to love those who love you, but it's another thing altogether when, when people don't love you, right? When, when people are kind to you and, and give you good things and are nice to you and encouraging to you, it's easy to love them. But when someone doesn't like you or maybe says evil things towards you or maybe steals something from you or harms you or hurts you or harms your family, it's hard to love them. Children, maybe you know about this. Maybe, maybe. I know, maybe not. But maybe you know about this. When, you, when your brother or sister isn't so kind to you, maybe they say mean things to you, poke you and pride you, maybe pinch you or pull your hair, don't let you play with their toys. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Adults, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Those are the times when it's, it's opportunity for, for your love to shine. It's where your, your love shines the most when it is the most difficult. That's what Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 46 and 47. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? See, like, like everybody, right? Love those who love you. But Jesus says, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? He concluded then, Matthew 5, 48, you shall therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, right? Love the unlovable. Love people who don't love you, right? Love your enemies. And that's, in fact, how deep God's love is for us. That's God's great love that He loved us when we were His enemies. Romans 5, verse 10. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. That's how great God's love is is that He extended it not to people who loved Him, but people who were rebelling against Him. He died for His enemies. And the Christmas is about the great love of God, how He cares for us and how He came to us. Which leads us really to our, our second point here this morning, which is God's great gift. It's the, the gift of His Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. The, the picture here is of God the Father Handing over God the Son as a gift to us. As a gift to us who would crucify Him and would kill Him. You know, gifts come in lots of sizes. Some are, are big and some are small. I've got a, a few gifts here underneath this Christmas tree. They are underneath our tree. And, and some are big and some are small. I have, have here a big gift. And you see what it says there? To dad from mom. This is a gift to me. That um, This is how it works, actually. But when you get older, you kind of talk about things. You say, you know what? This would be really nice if you gave me this. And Yvonne gave me the go-ahead. So I ordered on Amazon. And when the gift came, I, <laughs> I packed it away. And, and then I, I wrapped it. 
And then Sunday morning, I will open it and say, oh, thank you, Yvonne. I'll give her a kiss, and it'll be, it'll be really wonderful. So Yvonne knows what it is, and I'm not, you guys know what it is? Uh, uh, Hannah. Hannah always knows what every gift is of everybody in the house. So some gifts are, some gifts are big, and uh, some gifts are, are small, right? You read this one, right? College is working well. What does this one say? Dad from dad. To dad from dad, right? <laughs> This is a, a small gift that nobody knows what this gift... Do you even know what this gift is, Yvonne? Maybe. Okay, so this is one of those things that kind of came in the mail that I need, that I thought, hey, this would be kind of fun to have a Christmas. I don't, I don't need it now. It's really... They'll be like, oh, oh that's, a, that's a gift. So anyway, it's kind of like uh, if you're ordering something, I just, I just wrapped it up. That's what, that's what dads do. That's what the older you do, the older you get, that's what you, you get to do. But, but gifts come in, in all different sizes, all different types. Some gifts are very expensive. Some gifts are very cheap. Some are, are bought at stores. Some are ordered online. Some are, are made. Sometimes we make a gift for somebody. Sometimes presents have, have special meaning. Maybe a, a, an inside joke, perhaps, or, or just something special that would help. Some are practical. Others are decorative, which maybe I'm not sure if those are contradictory or not, but some... Um, But some presents we have, right, are a little different. Like I think one of the presents that we will have at our house is um, we bought SR a ticket to come home. And he's not coming home for Christmas because of his job. He's working there, but he's coming home. And that was an, an expensive present, but it's a present for all of us where he can come and be with us for a portion of our holidays. Now, we're not going to wrap him as a bow, right, in, in a bow, okay? That's kind of hard. But he's coming home to be with us. And that's a, a wonderful thing. And, and that's the sort of present that John 3.16 presents. It's a, it's a gift of a person. It's a gift of a son. It's the gift of God's son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. At Christmas, God didn't give us things. He gave us a present. He gave us his son. He gave us himself. Jesus Christ is the son of God. He was God in the flesh. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. And our message this morning comes from John 3.16. But you, you can turn back. Turn back a couple chapters. Right to the beginning of John. This is right in the context of, of chapter 3. Right, Chapter 1. We're introduced to the idea that God gave us Himself. He's identified here as the Word. John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then in verse 14, we see the Word being identified as the one who came into the flesh. We read in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, Jesus came in the flesh and dwelt among us. Do you notice how it describes this one who came in the flesh? We've seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The idea there is that He's the only Son from the Father. This is what was said in John 3.16, is that, that God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. This Word is the only Son from the Father. It's the one that God gave into the world. And this delves us into Trinitarian mystery. It, it begins with the Word. It says in John 1, 1 the Word was, was in, in the beginning, and the Word was with God. Proston theon. It was, it was face to face was this Word with God. And we see in the Trinitarian mystery that the Word was Jesus, distinct from God, because Jesus was face to face with God. They, they were there in fellowship with one another. And Jesus was God in the reality of the Trinity. And, and that's what Thomas said to Jesus when he was able to place his fingers in his hands and his side. He said, my Lord and my God. That's who he was. And the Trinitarian mystery is this, there's one God but three persons. And people have tried to describe it all different ways using all different types of analogies. But all earthly analogies fail. And it's no surprise because we're dealing with the greatest of all realities, right? The, the nature of God. And there's nothing on earth that, that can fully grasp it. I remember having a conversation one time with someone who was talking about the Trinity and this person didn't believe in the Trinity. And, and, and I tried to describe it this way, right? One God, three persons. And this person said to me, you don't understand God? No. <laughs> How can that be? I said, I don't know. But that's what the Scriptures teach. This is one of the best pictures that I see of understanding the reality of the Trinity. We see the, the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but the, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. 
We can't understand it, but those are things that the Scripture teaches. And the Scripture teaches here clearly is the Son is God from John 1. 1. And in fact, this is so important to, to Christmas love that some theologians have even, even said that we can't have love apart from the Trinity. Because to love, you need to have an object of love. I want to read for you a great article here written by Jared Wilson. I've read some stuff by him. He's really good. He's a director of content strategy at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's written a bunch of good stuff. He's just a great writer. And uh, here was his title to his, his article he wrote, No Trinity, No Love. He writes this, The religious person will suggest that love comes from God. But Christianity teaches that God is Himself love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. Love isn't God, but God is love. So what does it mean for God to be love? It doesn't necessarily mean that God is simply loving. Judaism and Islam and Mormonism proclaim a God who loves. But when Christians teach that God is Himself love, they're saying that real love itself is has its origin and essence in God. And this cannot be true unless God is a trinity. Think about it. A solitary God cannot be love. He may yearn to love. He may learn to love. But He cannot in Himself be love since love requires an object. And real love requires relationship. If the doctrine of the trin- In the doctrine of the trinity, we finally see how love is part of the fabric of creation. It's essential to the eternal need-nothing Creator. From eternity past, the Father and the Son and the Spirit have been in community, in relationship. They have loved each other. And that loving relationship is bound up in the very nature of God Himself. If God were not a trinity, but merely a solitary divinity, He could neither be love love, love, nor be God. So the trinity isn't some weird religious aberration that Christians have stupidly clung to. It's the answer to the deepest longing of the human heart. The trinity answers history's oldest desire. It even clarifies the question. It makes us go deeper, hear this, deeper than sentimental notions and ethereal feelings and elusive emotions. It puts us on solid ground with all this love stuff we've been chasing forever. We're all looking for love. And deep down, we all need it in ways we don't understand or even acknowledge. We search and search. We find glimpses, moments, tastes, and samples of love. We have genuine experiences of love, but yet nothing quite gets us outside of our own hurts, our own self-interest, and our own sins. We need the realest love there is. John 15, 13, Greater love is no one than this, that He lay down His life for His friends. Sacrificial love is the ultimate love. Now imagine the one who is love Himself sacrificed Himself. That's the idea. Here's the greatest gift. God sacrificing Himself. Imagine that the eternal loving fellowship of the divine community sent out one of their own to die not just for their friends, but for their enemies. Why would this loving fellowship do this? To make the enemies friends, of course. And this is precisely what God has done. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, takes on flesh and comes to die. And he who is true love might show true love and give true love and transform by true love that we might finally know true love. No trinity, no love. Hope you catch that, grasp that, think about that. And you can delve in those mysteries. You can read Jonathan Edwards speaks much about this if you want to go further. But because, right, God alone, in order to love, you need an object to love. And there in the Trinity, there's relationship, and God is the essence of love. And that's how great this gift is. And that's how God's great love is demonstrated and shown, that He gave Himself for us to give us our greatest need, which is eternal life, which really is the third point of my message this morning, God's great grace. We've seen His great love for the world. He's seen His gift of Himself, gift of His Son, And now we see God's great grace. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that, here it is, whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And notice how exactly it is we gain eternal life. It's not by religion. It's not by works. It's not by deeds. It's not by effort. It's not by goodness in us. It's by believing and trusting in Jesus. It's by trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus. That His death on the cross was sufficient to pay my sins. It's 
clearly in view here in John 3.16 when you hit the word perish. Whoever believes in Him should not perish. Right? In other words, the implication, if you don't believe in Him, you will perish. You will die. See, our sins have earned for us one thing. Death. That's the punishment for our sins. That we will perish for our sins. Apart from God's love and apart from God's gift. This is what would happen to us. We'd perish in our sins. Psalm 130, verse 3 and 4 says so good. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who would stand? It's a rhetorical question. O Lord, who would stand? If God would mark iniquities, we would perish. No one would stand. And then verse 4 comes in Psalm 130, but there is forgiveness with you. And forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ. It's one that John the Baptist saw when he saw Jesus coming toward him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's see if we can get it right here, right? Jesus coming. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It takes us back to the sacrificial imagery of, of the Old Testament when a, when a sinner would commit a sin and come and bring a lamb to, to sacrifice. He'd bring it to the priest and he'd confess his sin and he'd hand over the priest and the priest would take that lamb and slit its throat laying his hand upon the lamb, designated that the sin that you have committed, I'm praying that God would lay it on this one, this death of this one, and then puts it on the altar and burns it up as a soothing aroma, pleasing aroma to the Lord. And that's how Israel dealt with their sin through sacrifice, done millions and millions of times throughout history. Bring the lamb. Destroy the lamb. Burn it as sacrifice to the Lord. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes that away so we don't perish. And in fact, these words are interesting here because he's saying he, he took away our sins. Because the Old Testament sacrifices, they never took away sins. Oh, they, they dealt with sins, so they covered the sins. A little bit like when you, you clean up at home and you just you know, put your, 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 sweep your dirt under the rug. You're dealing with it, but you're just covering it. You're not taking it away. So when you vacuum it up and take it away and put it out in the garbage, it's gone. That's what Jesus did. But in the Old Testament, they just they covered up our sin. And how, how does God do it? God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we think about illustrating that. The best way to illustrate that is simply to go the verse before John 3.16. The two verses for, before. This is the divine illustration of what Jesus meant when He said, just believe on Him, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. He said this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. It takes you back to an obscure story told in Numbers chapter 21 about the time when the Israelites were in the wilderness and uh, they were wandering there, and they were, they were sinning. Uh, on this occasion, they were impatient. And I'll just read Numbers 21, 5-9. through 9, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. They said, why have you brought us up to Egypt to die in the wilderness? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food or no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Complaining against the manna that God had provided to them every day. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and it would live. Right? The story was, is simple. right? The Israelites were sinful. And so God gave them these poisonous serpents. And, and so that when, when sent these poisonous serpents to them. And so when they bit them, they would be sick. They would be deathly sick. But God says, I'll give you a provision. We got this bronze snake. And all you need to do is just turn and look at that snake and you will be healed. Now, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but maybe something like that. You recognize that symbol, right? It's a symbol of the American Medical Association. The snake around the, the pole there like that. And, and so think about that. You're, you're bitten. And you're in need of healing. All you need, you don't have to take any medicine. 
And the kid, kids, would, you know, no pair of Mary Poppins around at that time, right? With a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? The medicine, oh, I don't want the medicine. The medicine's not bad. The medicine is simply like Naaman needed to do. Just, just say, okay, that's what you want. That's what I'll do. He needed to dunk in the, the river, and, and here it is. You just need to look. <laughs> just, just look. There it is. And you're healed. But those who refused to look said, no, no, I got this. I got this, right? My leg's swelling and I'm in great pain. I got this. I don't, I don't need to look at that snake. I'm okay. What happened to them? They died. Because they didn't just look at the serpent. That's grace in the Old Testament. It could not have been easier. And that's what's illustrated the gospel, our, our imagery. Here it is. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I, I trust that you see the parallel. We may not be have bitten by poisonous snakes, but we have been bitten by the poisonous bite of sin. And the simple solution to our sin problem is a, is a look to the cross. And, and just as those bitten by the snake are so foolish that all they need to do is just turn and look at this serpent and they'd be healed. So likewise, people who are bitten by their sin simply need to look to Jesus and be healed. And yet, how many fools there are in the world? Paul said to those in Corinth that the gospel is foolishness to those that are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. But all, all people need to do is look to Jesus and their sins can be wiped away and they don't believe it. It is, it is very sad even as Jesus said, whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. That is God's great grace. And I just think about people who refuse that today. Uh, such an easy, simple solution. But people are always trying to, to do things differently, right? They're always trying to work their way. Or they're trying to religion their way. Or always trying to be righteous enough. And he's not talking about righteousness here. He's talking about believe in Christ. And we've seen in Romans chapter 4, right? When you believe in God, what comes down? He counts your faith as righteousness, and God's righteousness comes down upon us. It, it, it's, like a, it's like a gift that God has given to us, this, this great gift of His Son. He says, here, you just need to do this, right? And you can be forgiven. You just take this gift, and people say, no, no, I don't need that. I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good. No, no, God is giving you the gift. He's offering the gift, and so many people just turn it away. It really is quite amazing because Jesus tried to show the grace as, as much as it was. This is God's great grace. <clears throat> the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, at rescue from perishing comes simply by faith in Jesus. That's Christmas love. And extended to all who simply believe in Christ. I just encourage you today, if you're not believing, right, to believe in Jesus. To look to the cross just like they look to the serpent. And you will be healed very surely. You can know eternal life. And we who believe can say with Paul, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. So let's pray. Father, I do thank You for Your, your love that's deep. Loves us when we're enemies. The gift that was great, God, in giving Your Son to come and die for us. And then Your grace. God, that, that saves us simply by looking to You. As Charles Spurgeon was saved long ago, Isaiah 45, verse 22, Look unto Me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. God, You transformed His life when He just looked to You. And so, Lord, I, even I pray today You would transform lives. As people simply look to You and look to the One who has offered forgiveness to all who believe. Thank you just for, for Paul and we've been through Romans and just what that means of how we, we believe and trust in God and it's then, oh God, that you give us righteousness. Not that we are infused with righteousness or made righteous, but we are imputed with righteousness. God, that it's, it's your righteousness. It's, it's not us. It's not our own. And so for that we do, oh God, give you thanks and praise. God, and I would pray this Christmas season as we think about the the love of Christmas, Christmas love. May we think about just the extent to which you went to come to be among us and be despised, rejected of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. One who went to the cross and knew the, 
the cross was where he was going to go, but he went there for the joy set before him, enduring the shame, because he knew the joy set before him. He knew the eternity of, of heaven rejoicing with him and worshiping the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And so, Lord, I would pray by this Christmas season, may John 3.16 come special to us, come blessed to us, and that we would believe and trust in your Son. Help this be a, a thoroughly Christian Christmas this Christmas season. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.